One of the things that was really striking, when I, one of the things I think that probably made the biggest or one of the biggest impressions on me was the way people dressed. You know, in America, if you were a working class, ordinary person, you wore blue jeans. If you were a rebel who was out to change the world and bring down the government, you wore blue jeans. If you were a dope smoking hippie who wanted to drop out and just play the guitar, you wore blue jeans. Uh, and in England, you know, there were all these guys, you know, dressed in this incredibly flamboyant way. And there were codes of teddy boys and mods and then, you know, all these different and then eventually hippies, you know, with their dress and everybody, you know, dress was a way of expressing rebellion and difference and objection and, and, and whatever, which was just astounding to me and really startling and kind of opened my eyes to a different way of looking at, at all those issues, which, you know, I, clothing and presentation never been part of what I was experiencing as social change and revolution in America. One of the things that was interesting, because I think there's a long history in Western culture of um, slumming, middle classes wanting titillation with transgressive music or poetry or art or whatever. And they go and they see an exhibition, they go to Nadar in 1872 and they, you know, and they go, whoa, what's that, you know? And, but it's a, there's a distance. They get a vicarious thrill from seeing uh, La Boheme or from going to the Cotton Club in the 20s in Harlem, <laughs> you know, and seeing all these wild black people dancing to all these crazy jungle rhythms. And then they go back to Park Avenue and sip a cocktail very, very calmly. And, um, and I think this was one of the things that was so threatening to people about what was going on in 67 was that it wasn't just oh, wow, look at Sid Barrett in his flowered shirt, you know, playing his guitar with a broken bottle, you know, and then watching it and going home and sipping a cocktail. You went to the Pink Floyd gig and somebody slipped you a tab of acid and your, your own life changed in a way that that equivalent experience in previous periods of change had not accomplished the same level of personal change. I think the moment that Dylan stood on stage and sang uh, Maggie's Farm at Newport, um, and I was there as the production manager <laughs> standing right in front seeing it all, um, it was important because you could say that that was the first moment of what we now call rock. Nobody ever used the word rock. It was rock and roll, there was rhythm and blues, there was pop music. Rock was not a term that anybody used. Because in a way, the music, rock music, had to begin before you could name it. That was what Dylan represented. It was new. It never had been done before, really. And it all came from that. And he showed the way that that could happen. And it was considered a betrayal because he had been part of the folk music scene, which was a political protest movement. And he was seen as the next Woody Guthrie. And all of a sudden he's writing songs, you know, about things that have nothing to do with civil rights or protesting the war or injustice. They're about his internal life. They're very personal. And that was a revolution. I'm always reassured when I think about the legacy of the 60s by the fact that right-wing politicians usually get very irate looking when they talk about the 60s. And, you know, the more that the, the pompous splutter and, you know, talk in very angry tones when they talk about education and sexual liberation and women's liberation and racial equality and all these kinds of things. Oh, those bloody 60s, you know, we wouldn't be in this mess if it wasn't for them. That's always very reassuring to me. It means that the 60s did not live in vain.